It is um, an, a pleasure to have you join us today. Um, we welcome Dr. Chao Gan Yan, who is a professor at the Institute of Psychology at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He is a director of the Magnetic Resonance Imaging Research Center, director of the International Big Data Center for Depression Research, and the principal investigator of the RFMRI lab located at the Institute of Psychology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. His research focuses on resting state, functional MRI, computational methodology, mechanisms of spontaneous brain activity and their applications in depression. And Dr. Yen has a stellar record of research, including more than 80 publications in prestigious journals in our field, including PNAS and molecular psychiatry. His work has been widely cited in the scientific community and his papers have been ranked by the Essential Science Index in the top 1% of highly cited papers. And he was awarded in 2021 Early Career Investigator Award by the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. We're thrilled to have uh, you speak to us today. And we also thank you for the opportunity to um, benefit from the REST Meta MDD data that you've collected in your project. So let me introduce the title, which will be uh, the direct Consortium and the REST Meta MDD project toward neuroimaging biomarkers of major depressive disorder. So, welcome, Dr. Yen, and over Thank to you. you. Let me share my screen. Okay, many thanks for your invitation. It's my great honor to present our work to the Stanford community. So today my talk is focused on the direct consortium, the REST MDD project towards neuroimaging biomarkers to major depressive disorder. Actually, I read lots of paper by Dr. Williams group and also, I saw you also used our REST meta MDD data published some papers. I really hope in the future we can have some more formal collaborations. Okay, today my topic will cover the introduction where we build a direct consortium. And uh, direct uh, up to now, we have three phases. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what we have done for the phase one what's our current progress for phase two, and uh, what's our plan for phase three. And perhaps maybe we can have more collaborations. And I also know Dr. Williams lead the big depression as well as imaging project in the US. I really hope in the future we can have more collaboration. So depression is a global health crisis. And uh, as we know uh, by Mr. Churchill that uh, mentioned as a black dog. Many people have suffered from this kind of disease. There are over 300 million patients worldwide suffering from major depression. And this is also a severe problem in China. The prevalence is high. And you can see from all the ages, the depression ranks the, the most heavy burden across mental illness and also it can have very painful disaster. People may suicide from depression. So this is really a challenge. This is also our mission to find a better diagnosis and treatment. And uh, up to now, how we diagnose people with depression? Currently, we do not have objective biomarks. We cannot have blood tests. We cannot have uh, MR scanning that uh, find the brain biomarker that tells us this is the MDD patient. The current diagnosis is uh, mostly based, for example, like DSM-5, that the psychiatrist asks the patient, patient questions. And based on the questions and the observations, we we'll give the diagnosis. So this really hope in the future, we can find some kind of objective biomarkers. 
scientists have a profound lots of research to find objective biomarkers, maybe from pro-inflammatory cytokine, maybe from the cortisol, or lots of other methods. But currently, we do not have that objective biomarkers. For me, my background is more from brain imaging. You can use functional MRI to measure brain function activities. Alternatively, we can use structural MRI to analyze the brain anatomy. After all, we do think that, uh, that uh, depression is kind of disease of the brain. We have uh, chaos or some disorganized activity in the brain, so they are suffering this kind of source. So after all, we think if we find a better method to image in the brain, probably we can find some pattern or some biomarker to help diagnosis MDD and maybe inform us for better treatment. But currently, we do not have that one. For the FMR studies in MDD, uh, we can see some nature review, neuroscience reviews. We have small sample size and restrict power. We have very flexibility in data analysis and inconsistent findings. There are lots of appropriate status threshold leads false positive rates. So currently we do not have definite answer yet. So what should we do? And uh, one thing probably is a sample size issue. So as we have previously, we have a paper uh, analyzing how sample size matters. So if we have very small sample size, the test return reliability is very low. And also the sensitivity is low. If you have a very small sample size, you cannot find a significant results. And even if you found a significant results, if you have a small sample size, these significant results may not reflect true effects that positive predictive value is low. And also we see recently there's a paper in Nature. So they are talking about the reproducible brain matter association studies across thousands of individuals. So that means big data is the future. With a very small sample, we can find some hints, but uh, we want, if we want to have reproducible and convincible biomarkers, we have sh we surely we need to have big data. There's a lot of big data in the field. For example, in the US, there's a human connection project and now have the ABCD, Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Project. And also in the UK, have the UK Biobank. And also in, there's a data by Paul Thompson, the, the Enigma project that uh, have also have big data. And uh, today, mostly my talk, we are about a direct consortium. Is this a Chinese based uh, uh, big brain imaging consortium for depression data? The first project is a Morris Meta MDD project. The phase one, we have uh, 1,300 depressed patients and 1,100 normal controls. And the phase two, we have more subjects. So later I will discuss more how we developed this project and uh, what we found and what we are going to do. So next I'm going to talk about a direct phase one research. What are we doing for the direct phase one is we think if we need, if we want to find a neural imaging biomarks for MDD, that's one way might be practical. If we have big data for MDD brain imaging, plus deep learning, that's a very prevalent in the fields. Maybe we can find some kind of MDD brain imaging biomarker. But uh, if we want to go there, firstly, maybe we knew need to do some neural underpinnings MDD studies. We need to have computational sharing platform to accumulate the big data of imaging. And before that, we need to have a very good methods. There are lots of methodology challenges in FMR, like high motion standardization, multiple comparison correction. We need a validating FMR methodology. So most of prior work, we built lots on the methodology background. And then we build on the big data consortium, have big data and deep learning. And hopefully in the future, we will have neuroimaging biomarkers for MDD. And uh, 
Previous, we do lots of work uh, to addressing methodological issues in F4 mind. For example, the head motion. This is the imaging in a scanner. If the if the participant moves the height, the T1 image, you will see that lots of artifacts. If they have hold their height still, you have a clear image. This is also true in the functional data. If in the function data they move their heights, then there's lots of artifacts. And this, this issue is pretty critical as when we do development studies, the kids usually move their heights much more than adults. And uh, if we do in the disease studies, for example, schizophrenia patients move their heights much more than normal controls. So when we find some functional connectivity differences, is this because two of the neural mechanism are just simply because the schizophrenic patients move their heads much more and the artifacts induce this kind of differences. So we need an effective motion correction strategy. Today, I'm not going to the details, but uh, we did propose some effective head motion correction strategy. We use individual level correction with the Friesen 24 model and uh, at group level has a correction as a head motion covariate. And this strategy has been cited more than 1,200 times. It's a ESI top 0.1% highly cited paper. That means that most uh, users of our software, this method is a default. And if you use this method to control the head motion, the you usually the reviewers will not trace it after you that uh, are you results are the artifacts of head motion. And another issue is uh, standardization. And the standardization is because now the big data era and we have data from multiple sites. They have different scanners, they have different coils, they have different parameters. So how we better address the, 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 the artifacts of the sites. So we did propose some standardization strategy this is also what they use in the field. And uh, recently we have a new paper mm -hmm. under review, under revision in neural image. Yeah. We propose a new yeah. method yeah. for standardization. Yeah. So we hope for it, we can, we can uh, publish soon and uh, people can use this kind of new method. And also we, that multiple comparison is also, uh, Hello, somebody is not muted. Okay. Uh, that is uh, the cluster failure. The wire from my inferences of spatial action have inflated false positive rays by Ackland et al. They talk about uh, the prevalent multiple comparison correction issues is the methods have lots of artifacts. And this also induced lots of impact in the in other fields that they're talking about the last 15 years of family research might be totally useless because we use some long false positive race control strategies. And we also did some, some research to provide some guideline for how to perform multiple comparison correction. And we find a method to best balance the family wise error rate and reproducibility. We call the, uh, this is a permutation test with the TFCE, and this is also widely used in the field and all. And also, we develop methods, we improve methods, but if the people cannot use them straightforwardly, then nobody will care or methodological advancement. So we build the data process into a box. We, I think most of people, in your life also using the lots of imaging toolboxes, for example, SPM, alpha free FreeSurfer. But uh, in the field, there's lots of software have left many steps and the configurations and uh, it's difficult to learn. So big data area of neural imaging maybe need some new pipelines. So we did spend a lot of work to build the data analysis software that people can use in our methods conveniently. So this is, uh, we call it the DPAB, a computational share date processing sharing platform. We incorporated the previous software DPASF. We adapted the methodological updates like head motion, standardization, multiple comparison correction, 
We have a standardized preprocessing and pipeline. We have stated toolbox. We have platform for data sharing that direct a build on this software. We have a data sharing mechanism later I will introduce. So this paper has been set uh, about 2000 times. It's a ESI top 0.01% highly cited. Even CJ Ogawa, the inventor of our boat, also used our software to analyze the data. So we have the software, we have the methods. Lots of people are using our software and the methods. So then we started an idea that maybe we can connect it. We can connect our users by our software to make a big data consortium. So we have the we have searched the literature for the users who use our software, DPAS or DPAB, to analyze depression brain imaging data and invite them to join our big data consortium. That you do not need to share your raw data. You only need to share your data processed by our software, the final results, and we can share the data and everybody can join. So the first phase, we have three, 1,300 depressed patients and 1,100 normal controls is the world's largest MDD of my database. So basically the idea is we do not ask the members to share their raw data. We distribute the DPIB software and we train their students and uh, to how to analyze data with the DPIB. And with the DPIB, they have pre-processed the data. This is anonymized pre-processed results. And they only share those results to us. And then we can do data mining and also share the data with others. So with this, we call the alpha mice project that people can hold their data control and also will not leak the privacy of the participants, but we do data sharing. In the first phase, we have the data, we have 25 cohorts and uh, from the sex distribution, you will see more females are suffered than males. And uh, we, the first paper, we are talking about the default mode network functional connectivity because people always talking about default mode network. This is a network that always have highest activity during resting state. But when we do some task, its activity will be decreased and it's related to like illumination, like other lots of activities and uh, depression studies has related to network this network and uh, have lots of studies, but some papers talking about increased functional connectivity within the default mode network in depressed patients. Some others talk about uh, decrease. So both increase and decrease uh, literature exist. So that's uh, not a consistent findings yet. For our study, we have the biggest uh, residency of MAR depression imaging data. So we can do a big data mining. And what we found is a default mode network function connectivity decrease in the depressed patients. But this decrease is not in the first episode drug naive patients, but happens in recurrent patients. For recurrent patients, we didn't find the effect with the illness duration, but medication do have effects. And later I will talk about that. Uh, we do have a longitudinal study follow up to confirm this kind of effects. But here, this is for longitudinal. And uh, also I see Dr. Tozzi here and Dr. Tozzi also use this data to address the subsystems of the default mode network and with illumination. And um, I really enjoyed your study. And also beyond the former network, we also look at other networks like a visual network, somatomental network, and a dorsal attention network. They all showing decreased functional connectivity. So since the depressed patients have a disconnectivity of the, of the, of the brain network, but mostly it's in recurrent patients and the medication have an effects. And uh, we published this paper, this paper also has been set in more than 300 times now. And Dr. Liani Schumer, she's the chair of Enigma MDD working group. 
and uh, found or study the first large scale meta analysis of licensing function of my and also talking about uh, future collaborations between the two consortiums will be important for identifying potential cultural differences in brain alterations associated with MDD. In the, in the phase two, we do collaborate with Dr. Liani Schumer to see cultural differences. And also, uh, I also hope to collaborate with Dr. Williams in the future to see the cultural differences. And for the direct consortium, we do not want to just ask everybody contribute to your data and we just publish one paper and that's all. We want to have more, uh, more uh, achievements from the whole consortium. So we will invite the members to, to, to suggest some students to join our training. We train the students how to analyze the data and how to better have results and write papers. And we also invite the members to submit their proposal. We, for us, the consortium center, we just published one paper, but we invited members, you can have your ideas, your proposal to analyze this big data. So what were your ideas? So they submitted the proposals. We have a review committee. We will, we will coordinate between conflicts. Maybe two groups, so they have the same ideas. They need to merge or uh, who contributed more data, who take the lead. And we also give some feedback. Maybe you can revise your proposal better. We have lots of proposals approved. And then later the research phase one research output, we have many studies. For example, this one, when we talk about the function connectivity of depressed brain will decrease, but uh, the function brain network has also had top topological properties. How this change in depressed patients, we found the decreased global efficiency and dec decreased local efficiency in depressed patients. So this is from one participating member published in molecular psychiatry. And also from another group in the consortium, they just focus on dynamic function brain networks. And they also have found reduced the, the dynamic properties published in Neuroimage Clinical. And also the, another group, they are focusing, we found de default mode network functionality decrease in depressed patients. But this decreasing also has subtypes. We use the default mode network connectivity to subtyping the patients. So we have some uh, bio subtypes. So this kind of study. And also some people look at the hemispheric connectivity and other look at the subgroups of patients, for example, with or without gastrointestinal symptoms. And there are many more from the phase one study. I do not want to go to details. And uh, we also, later, we also open and share our rest matter MDD data. So everybody interested in, in depressed patients, big imaging data, you can use this data by accessing our dog, rest matter MDD. And there are about 300 applications now. They are all using this data to address their questions. This also includes uh, Dr. Tozzi's paper. And we also have a review paper in psychology audits talking about uh, why we have the rest matter MDD project, how we build a depression imaging research consortium, and what we will do in the future. We propose some directions, and now I would like to go to introduce some phase two research progress. And in the phase two, we did go to one direction, it's go to surface. So this paper is by Dr. Glasser's group. They are talking about the traditional approach that uh, we, the first, uh, the phase one of direct, we use in volumetric uh, methods. So did the analysis in volume space, but as I said, the traditional volume space approach has spatial localization that is only 35% as good as the best surface-based methods. So they have lots of methods to see surface methods is much better than the volumetric methods. And also they have some methods that uh, surface-based method is better, but they are talking about 
why lots of people still use volume methods other than surface-based approach. And there are two, two issues we think are important. That one is the relative lack of turnkey tools for learning a surface-based analysis. Second is the, the learning curve for adopting surface-based analysis methods is very difficult to learn. So if we can't address these two issues, we cannot ask the, the doctors, for example, the psychiatrists, to analyze the surface-based data and the contributor data. So firstly, we build toolboxes. We build the deprived surf pipeline is based on from prep free surf for ANS, FSL, Alpha, and Palm, Jamie, Pyramid, Lab, Dog, and DPIB. But you do not need to know the details that DPIB surf is the usage is very simple, just like as DPASS, one click, you have all the surface based uh, measurements. And we train the groups, they send the students to learn how to use DPIB surf to do surface based analysis. And then they contribute the pre-processed data. Again, they do not need to contribute the raw data because they have the data control issue, they have privacy issue, they only need to share the anonymous pre-processed data. So direct phase two data, the surface-based data sharing, we have uh, 30, 1,600 unipolar depression patients and uh, 1,300 health controls. And also importantly, if you want to find the biomarker have sensitivity, we also want it to have specificity that is not confused with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. So we encourage the members also contribute bipolar and schizophrenia data. So now we have 200 bipolar data and 300 schizophrenia data. So with this data, we can see we have 23 cohorts now. We have still the sex, uh, if females have much more and the different distributions. And we have some research progress on the phase two data. One is uh, the international collaboration with Enigma MDD. We want to see cross-cultural MDD data differences. And this is uh, with Dr. Liani Schumer. So when we combine the, our data, the direct consortium with the Enigma MDD working group, we have 5,000 MDD patients and the 6,000 normal controls, we can find the cortical thickness were massively decreased in depressed patients, increased dorsal, uh, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior single cortex, and the mortal cortex SMA. Interestingly, the visual cortex, they show, they show increased thickness than controls. And also you can see uh, clear here is a subgenual ACC, which is a very important region because lots of people using subgenual ACC to do functional connectivity to find a TMS target. But interestingly, when we split the data from the Chinese data, the director data, and the Enigma data, you will find that uh, if, the, if the patients are Chinese, you will more find more the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. And if the Enigma data, they have more Caucasians, you can see the subgenual ACC. So this is, we think, maybe we need to consider cultural differences, especially if we focus on subgenual ACC to find the TMS target in Chinese patients, we need to think about the cultural differences. So this is the first study of the phase two. And also another study is by Dr. Chen Xiao. He is uh, using the SGACC because lots of people think about use SGACC to find the DRPFC anti-correlation target. But is uh, the subject acid functional connectivity changed in the depressed patients? There's no definite answer yet. So he used this big data to analyze subgenual ACC and find if we do not do global single regression, a very controversial step in resting cell phone field, you can see the mostly are this uh, decreased functional connectivity with SGACC. And uh, as Dr. Fox, Michael Fox, original paper used global single regression, if we do global single regression, we can find a DRPFC target. And we found the DRPFC target is less separated, less anti-correlation with the subgenome ACC. 
That means it's less separated with the uh, HGACC in the depressed patient. And this kind of uh, uh, decrease uh, this uh, change in the functional connectivity also correlates with the TMI's uh, treatment improvement. And another question is, we're talking about, uh, always talking about the, the DRPFC target, but we have very different targeting strategies. But do the different target have different function connectivity differences in the depressed patients? We do find, for example, three kind of patterns, the BA46 and uh, the SGACC group target show similar effect that uh, decreased uh, the uh, the decrease of function connectivity with the DRPFC and increased function connectivity with the default model network. And the BA9 and the all group difference target is similar. And the five centimeter methods and the F sum beam show similar distributions of the functional alterations. So this we need to think about in the future, how we best target the depressed patients, the TMS target, uh, different targets has different uh, uh, alterations in functional connectivity. And also Dr. Liu Zhenning's group is using the big data for the different days. We have bipolar disorder, we have MDD, we have uh, schizophrenia. So we do the difference to find what's the shared and what's the specific uh, alterations in disease. And this is also in progress. And this is uh, by Dr. Yang Hong's group. We use a functional gradient and we found the uni model that have a further decrease in MDD, but in trans model like DMM have further increased gradient in MDD. And also Dr. Liu Yan Song's group is using the modular variability because we have the nodes, the brain network is separated in different functional modules and a node can be very flexible once at a time in this module, another time in another module. And this variability we found is increase in depressed patients. And finally, Dr. Wu Xiaoping's group is uh, investigating the functional stability in MDD that a uh, functional a voxel or vertex, the its connectivity profile, where this change a lot across time are very stable and the fund depressed patients has decreased stability in motor cortex and in visual cortex. But this is just some very brief introduction on research phase two, the, 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 the results. But we are still trying to uh, organize the results and uh, write manuscripts. We hope in the future, we can have better outputs for the phase two. And finally, please allow me to introduce what we want to do in direct phase three research. And uh, this one is, we also hope in the future we can have more collaborations. So phase three, we want to do four kind of studies. First is a direct individualized precise TMI study. So we do lots of imaging study. We find some differences, we found some results, but we want it to have real impact. We want to apply to depressed patients to change depressed patient treatment methods. So we develop some individualized precise TMIs. We want to do multi uh, cohort study. And the second is brain mechanism of antidepressant study. And the third is functional structure coupling study. And the fourth is lumination spontaneous thought study. And uh, first of the TMI study is, this is also led by another group in Stanford, Dr. Nolan Williams group. They developed the Stanford Accelerate Intelligent Neuromodulation Therapy. This is using each individual subjunior ACC to find a target on DRPFC and have very high dose TMS, ITBS treatment. And this one, they showed that within five days, the, the, the treatment refractory, the, 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 the patients, they can very effectively reduce the depression symptoms. And this can hold very long time that after one week treatment, uh, the effect is very strong. And this is without randomized control, but then the second year they have a randomized sham study and they found the, this scent 
protocol is very effective to reduce this the depression, but the shen cannot reduce the depression that effectively. So we think this kind of uh, methods can bring the insights or bring the hope to the depressed patient, especially for those treatment refractory patients. And there are many algorithms to, to identify the target. The first one is uh, like Michael Fox proposed using subgenual ACC to do a functional connectivity in DRPSC and find an anti-correlation spores. And this later they use, uh, firstly they use uh, about 98 subjects to build the target. And later in 2018, they use 1000 healthy subjects to build the target. But this is all based on, based on healthy controls and in the Caucasian, patient, Caucasian participants. The second one is uh, the scent. The scent, the, the description is not very detailed as the, in, their, in their paper. And the, the code is not shared. So we use our best guys to reproduce a scent method to find a target. So use the SGACC and do clustering and DFFC or do clustering and do anti-correlation and we find a spot, we use the same method. And the third one is when we have the SGACC functionality map, we have the big data. And importantly, uh, MacFox use healthy controls, but now we do have the MDD patients. We can use MDD patients, SGACC correlation maps. And we can use this to guide for each subject. We can use this to a dual regression to get individualized DRPFC target. So we use this as a direct mean map guided individualized precise TMS target. And the fourth one is when we have the depressed patients, we have health controls, we can do a group difference. We can use a group difference map to get individualization now we have a direct difference map get individual precise TMS. But before clinical practice, we want to use some data to prove this kind of methods just as theoretically may be meaningful. We didn't find a very good open data for the TMS treatment and improvement. We do find the Mexico data by Eduardo et al. And uh, the this is not depression patients. This is a Caucasian use disorder patients. They have TMIs. They have the TMIs. Those is uh, the, the, the off-target distance and the treatment effects. And then we use this data to analyze the TMIs targeting methods. We measure the TMS target offsite distance and the HMD improvement. If you use the Fox original methods, everybody use the same target. We didn't find any correlation. If we use the same method, we found a very strong negative correlation. That means the, the, the more offsite, or if here is the more accurate the target with the scent coordinate, then the better the improvement here it is. And also we use a direct mean method. It's even stronger. And if we use a direct group difference target is the strongest, that uh, the close the TMS target with the direct group difference algorithm target, then the highest the, 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 the uh, HMD uh, improvement. So this is, uh, we think we have some proof and uh, we want to like uh, to direct three, have uh, individual precise TMS study we can have randomization. We have the Fox target, the same target, and a direct group uh, individual targeted, and a, a direct um, the me individual target, and maybe some shell control, and uh, we can do the MRI. And uh, we will support each participant team. We will calculate the individual tax target for them, and also in our lab and in many participating labs, we have TMS robots that uh, we do not need to use hands to move the coil, but robots do it. And uh, we input our target and the robot moves the coil to stimulate the target. And uh, we use uh, kind of like scent protocol to do the TMS. 
The second one is brain markers on antidepressant study. Is in our PNI study, we found medication have a strong effect on the reduced function connectivity. And later, we coordinate, we collaborated with a, a, a psychiatrist group. Uh, we do collect the data before eight weeks medication and after eight weeks medication. We found whole brain reduced function connectivity after eight weeks treatment. And we can see the all the high brain disorder or high brain function networks show the reductions. And this is also not very big data. We want to do have more definite answer in future big data. And also in our lab, we also initiated a main flower project to live a jaw life that is in, because this is the history of psychology, we can now use medication. We use psychotherapy. We call the, that comb therapy. And we provide psychotherapy to the patients. And we do find that with this psychotherapy, the HAMD scores reduced almost for each individual patient. And also their anxiety uh, uh, measured by HAMA also reduced. And also, we are interested in their brain, and their brain also showed reductions. The reduced functional activity with uh, the psychotherapy. So we think about if we do have a reduced functionality with the medication or with the psychotherapy, seems the treatment can affect the brain with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, reductions in functional activity. But what kind of reductions? is what we want. And what others is just on some side effects. We want to figure that out. So we want to have a big data study that uh, invite all members, contribute their data, have the medication, pre-medication, and post-medication imaging to analyze this data. And the third one is a functional structure of fiber coupling study. Privacy is a little difficult to do the DTI studies. But now we have developed a new software called Deep Hyper Fiber. It's very easy to do DTI analysis like FA or MD or TPSS or the whole brain fiber reconstruction or do the automated fiber quantification or do the structural network analysis or structural function coupling analysis. So this, again, we will use this mechanism. We will train the members, their students, uh, how to use deep hyper fiber, and they can contribute the standard process results. And uh, similarly, like direct phase one or two, we can have the DTI multi site study. And lastly, is uh, some lumination spontaneous thought study because all lab in psychology side, we focused on lumination because lumination and depression are very closely related. Lumination is not only a future, but uh, also a risk factor for depression. We do develop some lumination paradigm. Psychologically, lumination is more negative, more sad, more about the past, more about self. And we do analyze the default mode network subsystem. We found that during lumination, the self, the default mode network core has more functional connectivity with the MTL, which is more related to past, that makes them more focused on past, but not uh, less focused on present. So that's why we want, if we want to intervene the, 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 the depressed patients for lumination, maybe we need to ask them less focused on past, but more focused on present. And maybe if uh, we think that uh, if the core and the DMPFC subsystem has a reduced function activity because DMPFC has a, has a, a on the cortic surface, maybe we can use TMS to, to intervene to uh, this kind of function activity to reduce rumination. And also we, our lab, we have some other machine learning guides. We use classification, classification, rumination, cell memory, and uh, resting state, and we can have very high accuracy to predict what a uh, paper, their thoughts, their mental states are. And also we found in depressed patients, they have much more lumination episodes 
during Russian state. And finally, is uh, we developed another paradigm. We called it uh, Think a Lot of Mark. We ask uh, participants scan in the scan in the scanner, but they also vocally speak out what they are current in their minds. And we have the MR compatible microphone. So we found all the brain networks involved in representing the brain networks. And we hope this can also apply in the depressed patient studies. And then we do find the spontaneous source that uh, you, you are doing nothing, but uh, that's a lot of source in your mind. The depressed patients will have much more, uh, much more about self and uh, much negative and uh, in their emotion experiences. And for this kind of source, they have much more concern, anger, guilty, disgust, fear, and the less surprise, happiness, lack, and pressure. And this is, we also want to invite the direct uh, consortium members to do collaboration in direction phase three. So phase three, we have the direct individualized process TMS study, brain maximum antidepressant study, functional structural coupling study, and illumination spontaneous thought study. So we hope in the research phase three, we can have more collaborations and more uh, outputs. And finally, we also, our lab for depression study, we have some documentary on CCTV or Beijing TV. You can scan the QR code to watch the documentary films. And uh, we also provide open course for how to use our software for DPIB, DPASP, DPIB Surf, DPIB Net, and the future DPIB Fiber. If you're interested in how to use our software, you can access this for free course. And, um, and finally, I would like to thank my collaborators, my students, and my funding sources. And uh, thank you again for your invitation. And uh, thank you, anyone, for asking questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for such an invigorating uh, presentation. And congratulations on incredible um, data acquisition and to create such a consortium for so many people to use. It's really wonderful, and we look forward to collaborating directly very much. I do know we have questions, so um, I'm wondering if the first, if you want to answer them live. Um, Shui, are you able to read them out? Can you see them? Okay, I saw. I, I can read them out. Sorry, I, no, sorry, I'm just. Uh, so the first one is: What age group are your participants in, and how is age modeled? when comparing across different age groups? So for the phase three, for the phase one, mostly are the adults. So in that group, we do have uh, younger uh, adolescents and uh, older uh, participants. But uh, in the first study, in the PNS study, we, we, we stressed that between 18 and 60 years old. And in the phase three, because uh, in the phase two, because more sites joined in, there is a, there is a, the group is purely adolescence. It's between 12 to 18, I think. But I'm not sure how we analyze this age effects yet. In the first study, is uh, we use age as a covariate. But uh, I do saw some groups, they do divide the patients into adolescents and adults and maybe elder adults, and they do investigate the, 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 the aging effects. Um, I, I do see in our consortium members, there's a paper recently just submitted, submitted biological psychology, but I don't know if we, they can target that. And uh, there are lots of uh, similar studies like that. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, the next question is, in the latest direct publication, it mentions functional lateralization differences between depression and healthy controls, MDD and healthy controls. So the question is, is there, a lat is there lateralization data comparing depression, MDD to treatment, de treatment resistant depression, or in the case of neuromodulation, TMS remitters to non-remitters? Yeah, this is a, 
uh, this is a very great question that uh, because that uh, in TMS study, usually we, we stimulate the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And somebody even is think about, oh, we use, a, you use some other kind of frequency, like a low frequency to the right DRPFC. So I think lateralization is very important issue in depression. But uh, my group didn't uh, do the lateralization differences, but the data is open. If you're interested, you can, you can definitely go to analyze the lateralization effect. And uh, for the neuromodulation, currently we do not have too much data yet. We are trying to, trying to coordinate have a multi-site TMS study in phase three. We hope in the phase three, we can have the data, have limiters and non-limiters and analyze why our algorithm works on some patients, but not others. If they have the bio subtype, and in the future, maybe we should first scan their brains and based on their brains, we can choose this kind of algorithm, or maybe this guy is not suitable for TMIs. Uh, for anyways, maybe not suitable. So use some other methods. I hope for it in the future we can use brain imaging to gather treatment. That would be fascinating. So maybe that's phase three and phase four. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think Dr. Tosi has a live question. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you very much, Dr. Yen, for uh, accepting our invitation. And thank you for your very kind words on our study. Uh, working with the REST MetMDD has been really invaluable. So thank you so much for sharing this great data. And uh, I had a question about, uh, you know, you mentioned some people, uh, uh, when looking at resting state networks, uh, some people find that MDD patients have higher connectivity, others find lower, and sometimes there's this inconsistency. And so do you think that maybe in the MDD population in general, there might exist subtypes, for example, a subtype with higher connectivity, one with lower, and when we pull them together, we get these like smaller differences across. And if you think that might be the case, uh, how do you handle this when uh, you know you plan on moving to the treatment studies? Thank you. Yeah, that very great question. I do, I do that. Uh, that there's one paper almost on the same time with the your neural image clinical paper is also on neural image clinical. Uh, I have a very brief introduction. Is the default mode network subtype bio subtype using the default mode network to do clustering analysis and some patients should more increase and some patients should more decrease. I think in the future, it, is, it will be great that we can use a brain network to subtype them. And this is the important question is we need more information. Is this subtype is just related to age or related to sex or related to the the, the severeness of the illness or related to the treatment because some subtypes, they are more better for medication and some others, they are more for the TMIs and some subtypes is, is very medication treatment to refractory patients. So I think there's a vast space in the future and uh, we do need more data and more information. This is also why in the direct consortium, we want to want to work more coordinately, more uh, share with each other. So if uh, we move as a consortium in the future, we have we can have some prospective study. Then that will be much better. We can design what kind of information we want to have, and everybody use the same protocol to acquire data then we can do much more important analysis. Thank you very like, much. Uh, like you, you also have a paper, I think uh, it, it, your, your paper is uh, about the HCP depression. I, you call it HCP, H emotions, like, yeah. like that. Disordered emotional states, yeah. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, yes, <laughs> thank you so much. It's great to meet you in person. <laughs> very nice to see you. <laughs> I think what you're highlighting on about the standardized approach is going to be so important to be able to pool all the data that we're gathering and answer those different questions, right? 
is it treatment is it cultural differences are there changes over time uh, does it matter who's getting what treatment all of those factors I think we have time for one last question so uh, Dr Chung I think you're going to ask yours live Yes, thank you, Lian. Um, I want, also want to say thank you so much for accepting our invitation, Dr. Yan, and also thank you for so, so many efforts you put in to educate the next generation neuroimaging scientists. I benefited a lot during my college. Um, I think one thing you mentioned is very interesting to me, that the difference between your big data versus the Enigma MDD data set, I wonder if you think I think you indicated it might be related to cultural difference. I also wonder if it's related to maybe the main symptoms that's been different in the Chinese community versus, you know, European community. Um, given we know that for Chinese community, they have more somatic sy symptom. And just wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, that's a very great question. That uh, one thing it may be related to the 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 if there's a community sample or uh, a hospital sample or like for example the H A M D severity, uh, I I forgot the details results, but uh, I think we did a matter regression with the uh, with the H A M D severity. I forgot, but I, I think I didn't. We didn't find the the effect on subgenic ACC. I need to check, and uh, I hope we can finish that paper as soon as possible. This is in, is in progress. Wonderful. We have one last question in the chat, so we'll we'll get it in in the last few seconds. Um, it's a thank you uh, for your very much for your talk from another Dr. Chang. Uh, wondering if your data or future data involve interventions or treatment in the patients and whether resting fMRI tells us anything about intervention recommendations. So there is some is current and some is future. Currently in my life, we have the Manda Flower project. We recruit patients. We have trained a team about 40 psychotherapists with a very stimulated psychotherapy. We provide a psychotherapy. We, we have the, we have uh, the, seeing the really this is a very grateful for me that we do think a lot of change in the patient's life and the sex therapy helps them a lot and uh, not and uh, of course you can see the hmd decreasing hama decreasing and we see the brain function connective decrease but still some have the better effects than others why maybe we need to analyze the data more carefully in the future so this is still in progress. We about uh, we only recruit twenty patients up to now, but uh, hopefully in this year we can do, recruit much more. And the future is that we hope we can do TMI study across many sites. Hopefully next year maybe we can have a very big TMI study, and uh, we can use the data to help us to decide this kind of functional connectivity map should not do TMI directly. Or maybe this kind of my, okay, the, here is the best target. You can go ahead. Wonderful. Well, that's a great future goal and um, note to end on. So thank you again for joining us and sharing just this incredible uh, set of data and consortia that you've established. As um, Shui said, it's really been wonderful to have so many people learn from you and to share the data. So we look forward to keeping in touch about the direct collaboration. And thank you again for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a happy new year. Yes, likewise. Thank you everyone for joining us today in the um, Cutting Edge Seminar Series and to our co-directors, uh, Dr. Tozi and Dr. Chang. And we will join you again for the next seminar shortly. Thank you again uh, for the presentation. Okay, bye-bye.